Welcome back. All right, it's rapid fire time with Dr. Shabir Ali. So Dr. Shabir, let's get started. Is it shirk, uh, or in other words, associating partners with God, if one stands for his, for his or her country's national anthem? No, that is not shirk. Shirk in its most uh, strict definition would mean ascribing someone else uh, as partner in God's divinity. So to say that God has an equal. Uh, some people e extend that uh, in a way to say that if you uh, take your laws from other than God, then then that is a form of shirk as, as well. And one can cite some precedents for this even in the Quran itself. Uh, but one should not take those precedents to uh, reach such a strict conclusion uh, to the extent that if you, you're, you're nationalistic, you support your country, you support your country's laws and so on, then this is all shirk. No, this is uh, not of that, of that category of associating a partner along with God. It's just what people normally do. They um, uh, celebrate their country and the anniversary of their country and they uh, stand up for the national anthem to show their respect for the laws and the constitution of their country. This is to support something that is good and uh, that is um, not, not um, something decried in the Islamic system. Okay, and the next question is, why do you think, uh, sorry, what do you think about Surah Baqarah, verse 275? And the viewer is asking, because in a video you end up rejecting jinn possession totally, or so it seemed, doesn't it oppose that, the Qur'an itself? Well, this verse in the Qur'an does not actually say that jinns possess people. Um, the verse says, uh, as for those who take interest, um, literally those who eat interest, uh, they will not stand except as stands one who is knocked by the Satan. Uh, uh, almost like knocked to the ground, but it's almost like somebody who get, gets a heavy slap mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, maybe he staggers from it. Uh, so the, the classical commentators accepting gene possession as a fact, because they know that from other sources, they, they interpret this verse of the Quran along the same lines and they say, okay, this refers to a person who is possessed by the devil and so, you know, he falls to the ground out of the effects of this jinn possession. Uh, but the, the verse by itself does not imply all of that. Only if you start with the presupposition that jinns possess people, then you might interpret the verse in that uh, direction. But the verse by itself only uh, says that uh, the person who um, at eats interest uh, will possibly rise on the Day of Judgment, uh, will rise possibly on the Day of Judgment, as the one who has been knocked by the, by the Satan. So, uh, you know, knocked by the Satan, almost like slapped or hit, it seems like an external thing, whereas jinn possession is an internal thing. So there, there seem to be two different things here, jinn possession on the one hand, and what the Quran is speaking about on the other hand. So I'm just gonna clarify, because the viewer also asked about jinn possession. So you do believe jinn possession exists? Well, in, in a, on a previous occasion, I tried to explain that uh, I don't see uh, sufficient reason for a accepting that as a religious teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if one thinks, okay, I, I know a guy who was jinn possessed and I saw it before my very eyes and I saw the practitioner working on him and then the jinn left this person and uh, you know, I'm so convinced this is a reality. Well, okay, that's from practical experience. I have not had the same practical experience. In fact, some of the experiences of a similar nature that I've had have convinced me the other way, that mm -hmm. it's, it's not a reality, it's a psychological phenomenon. Uh, the person believes that he is jinn possessed and then the exorcist works on him and then they, now he believes that the jinn has left him and of course now he's whole. So he had a psychosomatic illness and now the illness is gone because now his mind is made up, I don't have a jinn. Mm -hmm. So it's a psychological phenomenon, it's not uh, a, a reality that the jinn actually possesses the person. As a, rea a religious teaching, I do not find anything in the Quran that requires Muslims to believe that jinns possess people, nor is there any of the authentic hadith narratives that requires this. Uh, so it's, it's not a religious teaching. I wouldn't classify that as a religious teaching. I would classify that as based on practical experience. Some people think that it's a reality and some people may think maybe from the same practical experience that, that it's not a reality. Mm -hmm. Okay, very interesting. Um, next question is, I have heard your debate between you and David Wood, but my question to you is, can you show me where in the Bible Muhammad, peace be upon him, is prophesied? 
There is no place in the Bible that mentions his name specifically, but uh, there are indicators that they will be a prophet. First of all, in general, they will be prophets as and when needed, according to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse number 18. And uh, there, there seems to be no limit. One has to find a limit. Like in the Quranic context, when somebody asks, how do we know that the Prophet Muhammad, in whom be peace, is the last of the prophets, one might uh, point to the 33rd chapter of the Quran, the 40th verse, which says that the Prophet Muhammad Muhammad is the Khatam and Nabiyyin, is the seal of the Prophet. Someone might say, well, okay, that means that he's the last of them. So the Muslim has a certain proof that shows that the Prophet Muhammad is the last of all of the Prophets. Now, if we ask somebody who's been reading the Bible, tell me from the Bible, oh, where, it sh where is your proof that a, a last Prophet has come? Well, there's no such proof. So that means that there is the possibility that prophets will keep coming as already depicted in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. In the New Testament, Jesus on whom be peace is said to be speaking about uh, prophets to come in the future. And he's uh, giving a way to differentiate between the true and the false prophets. And he says, by their fruits, you will know them. Now, if Jesus on whom be peace was the last of the prophets, he could have said, I'm the last of the prophets and after me, no other prophet will come. There'll be no need to give a criteria and here is how you differentiate between the ones who will be true prophets and who will be false prophets. And in fact, we know from the New Testament, especially the Acts of the Apostles, that there were persons who were called prophets after Jesus. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily that Muslims accept them as prophets, and they're not said to be prophets in the same way as Muslims believe, let's say, the Prophet Muhammad or Jesus as prophets, at that uh, ultimate level of being a direct recipient of revelation from God in that kind of uh, distinct sense. But there were persons who were receiving some kind of inspiration and uh, speaking about future events they will call prophets. So uh, there seems to be no end to the series of prophets given the biblical narrative. And uh, Muslims have good reasons for thinking that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a genuine uh, prophet of God. There's more we can add, but if this was not rapid fire, mm -hmm. I, I would have expanded. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Uh, okay, next question is, what is the meaning behind women obeying their husbands, Islamically speaking? Uh, the viewer is saying Quran says one thing, Hadith says another, and the viewer is uh, confused about uh, what approach to follow. Yes, uh, to agree with the viewer very quickly, there are Hadiths uh, that go to extremes on this. For example, a Hadith that says, if uh, you know, I were to command, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is speaking and saying, if I were to command, anyone to uh, prostrate before anyone else, I would command women to prostrate before their husbands. So this, if this is taken to be an authentic narrative from the Prophet, peace be upon him, would we mean that uh, women have uh, such uh, a, a, a duty to op uh, obey their husbands, uh, because if prostration is a sign of anything, it means an ultimate kind of surrender. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I don't consider this to be an authentic narrative from the Prophet, peace be upon him. And, um, uh, other hadiths that go to such extremes in depicting the uh, relationship uh, between a woman and her husband as being one of subservience uh, cannot be the, the reality. The, on the other hand, the Quran, uh, which is our primary source, uh, shows that there should be a kind of mutual um, agreement between husband and wife in many things. In general, the Quran says, Amruhum shura bainahum, the matter of the believers are by mutual consultation. Uh, and uh, in uh, depicting what ha how, how a husband and wife should go about their affairs in deciding, for example, um, about the breastfeeding details of their child. Uh, the Quran says this should be done by mutual consultation between the husband and wife. So it shows that there, there are to be consultations on the affairs uh, uh, of, uh, of the, the family life. Um, there is a verse in the Quran, Surah 4, verse number 34, which is generally uh, construed by cl classical Muslim commentators as indicating that a woman ought to obey her husband. But technically, the verse doesn't, actu do doesn't actually say that. The verse speaks of women obeying, uh, but it seems that uh, the, in its context, it's really obedience to God. Uh, because a similar uh, terminology is used of Mary, uh, who in the Quranic depiction, depiction did not have a husband, but she is given the similar type of uh, description that she's obedient, which means uh, obviously obedient to God. Uh, so the, the, in our modern context, obviously things look different than the things would have looked to people in classical times. Yeah. You see, when people accept something to be a reality and a truth and like an unquestionable uh, given, 
uh, in a society, naturally they interpreted the Quran uh, in the light of that given. So they thought that the Quran is saying the same thing. So in past societies it was a given that women obeyed their husbands. So that was natural and people couldn't con conceive of, of it at the time as being any different. So if that was the truth, then when they looked at the Quranic text, they saw the same truth mirrored in there. Now in our times... that was times, the bias that they were going to the Quran with. Say again? That was the bias that they yes, were going exactly. to the Quran with. Yes, exactly. It was their bias, yes. Mm -hmm. And of course we have a different bias and who's to say whose bias is true. Yeah. Some people will say, you know, just go with the bias of the previous generations and they wouldn't call it a bias. They would call, they would think of it and try to convince themselves that this must be the ultimate truth. But, uh, uh, you know, ultimately it is uh, the bias of a previous generation. And yes, we have our own biases too. Uh, we shouldn't try to deny that. Our, our whole thinking is shaped by our whole life experience and not only our experience, but the whole history of humankind. You know, lo knowledge has grown and developed and accumulated and we're trying to acquire the little bit of that knowledge that we can. So based on our knowledge today, marriages work well when um, husbands and, and wives are you know, in mutual agreement and there, there's no real boss in the family. They just do everything in a cooperative uh, manner. Um, and if they need to you know, settle their affairs because they can't agree with each other, then they go seek independent counseling. Um, uh, so this seems to be a, a, a way of ensuring harmony in, in modern times. And given that to be our reality, it, it would be odd to impose on Muslims of our present times to say, well, you know, the boss of the family must be the man. Um, because that will uh, obviously not sit very well with uh, women and uh, that will have difficulties uh, you know, in terms of bringing up the next generation of young girls uh, as, as committed Muslims because they have to feel it and live it and own mm -hmm. it as, as their own. And uh, if we have uh, things like this which will be so counterintuitive to them as, uh, as being main teachings in our religion, this could be a difficulty. So we must uh, be willing to interpret the passages of the Quran where interpretations are possible. We can't force anything on the Quran. We have to accept the Book of God, but where interpretations are possible uh, to take into consideration the realities uh, of the time and place in which we live and our own consciousness, um, that, that should be done. So. Um, the, the bottom line is that I would say that uh, there is nothing in the Quran that indicates clearly that uh, women have a religious duty to obey uh, their husbands. Uh, now, of course, if people live in certain circumstances where this is the norm, uh, then they will have to negotiate for themselves how they work within those norms. But the norm within which I'm speaking uh, is the, the modern egalitarian society and uh, I do not find that there is anything uh, in the Quran that gives against this um, egalitarianism uh, within a family. I'm always impressed by your ability to come up with these responses so quickly. Thank you very much, Dr. You're Shikar. quite welcome. If you want more of Let the Quran Speak, you can watch previous episodes or new ones by subscribing to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Quran Speaks. Stay updated by liking us on Facebook, and following us on Twitter at Quran underscore speaks. And when you're on the go, listen to our podcast at QuranSpeaks.com.